Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode 16. You got myself, Ryan, we've got Jackson, hey. we've also got Sam. On today's show, we're going to be discussing industry. Sam's going to take us through that and what's been going on in the world of film. Then, Sam actually had the pleasure of uh, taking an interview, or doing an interview, should I say, with John Ward, an independent filmmaker. And then we're also going to be doing our monthly horror discussion. And uh, this month, we're going to be discussing haunted houses. So, without further ado, Sam, do you want to take it away with industry? Okay. So cinemas are looking to reopen in the UK in June. Um, seems quite soon. They're supposedly going to do a lot of precautions. I, I uh, don't know if it's, yeah, if it's too soon for this, but there are other countries such as uh, Germany will be opening up more cinemas this month. America, certain states are looking to open. Things are starting to go a bit back to normal. Austin theatres were open a few weeks weekends ago. And essentially, 3,000 people turned up on that weekend. Crikey. That's terrible. Yeah. And this is for old films like um, Bloodshot and The Hunt. All those March releases that yeah. were never to be. So it's kind of... It, I don't know. It's like yay for cinemas, but is it yay for us as a society? I suppose in terms of like the film industry, it's kind of good news because they're going to get some revenue. But as a person, it's a little bit worrying. Yeah, and the industry is looking to move forwards. Uh, there is a production plan that the UK is currently producing. Steven Soderbergh uh, is working with DGA to try and get a method of when they go back to work of how they're going to do it. It's all still kind of up in the air, and maybe too preemptively soon. We'll see. Paul Schrader, um, the film director and writer, he had an idea about like getting Netflix to essentially put all the festivals on to do some sort of special streaming kind of uh, thing through their subscription. And I think it's a good idea. Whether people would actually do it, I don't know. But the whole way that we're supposed to, with award season coming up later in the year, the whole usual route to it doesn't work anymore. So I think people are trying to find a new kind of... Solution? Yeah, essentially, yeah. In casting news, Kate Blanchett has been cast in the Borderland film, which um, I forgot was being made, but it's being directed by Eli Roth. Um, it's actually been written by the guy who created Chernobyl. Oh. So uh, it makes you wonder what kind of tone, from, from what I remember, despite like every time I played that game, I would just get lost, deeply lost, and then get killed by something. Yeah, he was, he was terrible. Yeah. I don't know what game Sam's ever been good at. <laughs> but it's got a sense of humour to the game, and Eli Roth's known for that, so maybe this will be good. She's going to be cast as Lilith. When it goes into production, that'll be decided later, but I guess they're clearly gearing up to something. I guess they're hoping to shoot by the end of summer. Tom Cruise, the man who will do any stunt and also kind of crazy with Scientology, is shooting a film in space with Elon Musk. So, you know, first thoughts was, okay, Mission Impossible's gone to new places. But doing, there's not much research you can do about it, but apparently it is a new narrative film produced in space. <laughs> I just, uh, what, uh, they don't need to go to space for this. They don't, like, what a waste of resources. A stupid, sorry, I, I, it makes me really angry. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> the jury's out. It's, it's whatever reasoning, and yeah, it is pointless for the cost of it and stuff. But at the same time. Environmental cost of it. Sorry, I'm getting political. It would be interesting <laughs> to see a film shot in space, but what's the reason? Is it just like because it's Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise wants to film in space? Is he going to do the greatest stunt ever done? Guess we'll see. <laughs> what would that look like? I don't know, I've been trying to picture it, and I, I can't picture what he'll do, but we'll see, we'll see. I mean, he he'll is also... He'll run in space, he, he loves a run. He is an actor, we have to remember that Tom Cruise can act, and now and then does like to try and act, and he's not been, just do he's stunts. He's been known to, he's been known yeah. to act. Uh, no, come on, I, like, I think Tom Cruise is always a win. It's a choice, it's a choice. It's an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Spike Lee's new film, which is coming out on Netflix, has just been announced. It's going to be released next month on June the 13th, which is kind of surprising. I mean, Netflix likes to do this. They don't always like to tell you months beforehand. They'll just be like, boom, new film. That's it. 
And I feel like it was going to screen at Cannes Film Festival. Pretty much guaranteed. I mean, Spike Lee was the head of the jury. It was going to be screened. And it'll probably still play into the festivals, um, not festivals, the awards later this year. I'm quite looking forward to it. Spike Lee's, he's a genius. He's a very unique voice. And it's only recently that he's actually been given more of a budget to be able to do what exactly he wants to do. Black Landsman made a lot of money. So yeah, that's uh, De Five Bloods. That'll be coming out next month. And it's a Vietnam film as well. So it'd be interesting to see him do a war film on a much smaller, lower indie release. You Are Gonna Be A Star, our horror comedy anthology, will be released on May the 13th. You can currently click the little alarm button on the video so you can get excited and watch it with us 7 p.m. Wednesday the 13th. On YouTube. Featuring a collection of different indie actors who've all shot this film during isolation. It's kind of silly and it's, and it's supposed to be just a bit of fun. So I, yeah, hopefully you'll be with us on Wednesday. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate that. Um, and back to Sam, actually. So Sam had the pleasure of having an interview with John Ward, an independent filmmaker like ourselves. So uh, over to you, Sam. Okay, it's Trash Arts Talk. I'm here with John Ward, who is a filmmaker from Las Vegas. Is that right? That is correct. So let's talk a bit about how you got into filmmaking. Uh, it originally started way back when um, I saw Star Wars and Close Encounters and knew that's what I wanted to do. And then once I was able to start playing around with, uh, you know, like Super 8 and 8mm, uh, and then went into VHS, just did little projects here and there. And uh, high school started shooting like uh, music videos for the uh, for my friend's garage band. And then ended up going to two community colleges, uh, College of Marin in Northern California and uh, Los Angeles City College in Southern California. I took a bunch of filmmaking classes, made a bunch of shorts, some were finished, some weren't. Went off, I was a PA uh, for uh, commercials and and, uh, uh, films, short films in LA. Uh, And then things just kind of stopped. And for a while things just stopped and I just worked retail and then one day uh, David Sterling called me up and said hey do you want to go work on this movie called Clown Motel which is now Clown Motel Massacre and it would actually be shot at the Clown Motel and I said yeah great and uh, so I went up and, and I was a PA but the guy who was supposed to play the killer clown uh, he couldn't do it for whatever reason it was I think it was a, a work conflict and so the director and the producer, Philip Tricky, said, well, you're now the clown. You're now the killer. Oh, wow. So I was like Freddy Krueger of the movie. Yeah, so I, I jumped from a production assistant to the main bad guy of the movie. I decided to wear a clown suit and put the makeup on and everything. And, uh, and from there, I thought, well, this is interesting. I can... I see that there's a small crew and a small cast that we're making a feature film. And then after that, um, I met, um, I work at a storage facility and uh, I met one of our tenants uh, named John Seymour and he was putting together another feature film called Drug Z and uh, which was a zombie type of thing. And we shot that over a few months. Once again, small crew, small cast. And he was pretty much doing almost everything. And, uh, I thought, this is amazing. I've now worked on two films where it's like a three-man crew with a small cast, and we're making a movie. I didn't think this could be done. I thought you had to have, you know, 50 people working on your film. And then put together Aximus and uh, was able to shoot at the storage facility I worked at and used, you know, some of the people from, uh, uh, from Drug Z on that. And then from uh, John Seymour had auditions for another film. And so that's where I got the remaining people like Ashley Campbell uh, to be in the film. And that's what started it. So it was these really these two films uh, brought me out of this kind of hibernation of not really doing anything for a long time. Let's um, now boom, that's let's uh, let's go let's go more in detail about talking about the Axmas franchise because obviously that's one of the franchises that um because there's a couple of sequels isn't there is there is it the third one that was to prepare to shoot soon 
Because you have two out, don't you? Uh, yeah, Axmas and Axmas 2, Blood Slay, those are the two that are available now on DVD. Um, they're released through Screamtime Films. Uh, and uh, that's a, a Todd, a, a, <clears throat> pardon me, Todd Jason Fallon Cook's company. And uh, they've done very well. I'm, I'm really happy that they well, And also Brad Twig has, uh, is going to be releasing the second one. Um, he's already released the first one on his uh, anthology series. And those vary. Like the first one is available on uh, Frames of Fear 2, which then was picked up by Wild Eye Releasing and changed to Brutality. And then Axis 2 will be released on uh, Fright Vision, uh, which is another anthology. Oh, nice. But between, yeah, it, it's cool because it, it's one, one short film that's like 30 minutes. Uh, now two short films that are around 30 minutes uh, have two distributors. And each one of those gets its own special features. So they come out on DVD. So everything that Brad has is totally different than what Todd has. So if somebody wanted to buy both, they'd get the same movie, but the special features would be different. So then that way, I, you know, I felt, well, they're not wasting their money. And it's, yeah, that's where we're going into, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, I mean, we'll, we'll see uh, what happens. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're going to shoot parts three and four back to back. Oh, nice. Are you, um, <clears throat> yeah, very, very you, happy about that. That's fantastic. Now you, you've worked on a v- variety of different horror anthologies. I know you've done some stuff with me and Tony Newton and plenty of other people. Is there any particular ones that are like, uh, favorites of yours or ones that really gave you, made you think about filmmaking even more by, I always find every anthology I do, you learn a little bit more each time. Uh, well, I like your stuff and Tony's stuff. I think that's those are really fun. I really enjoy that. Uh, those, to me, you have to be creative because they're they're short films. Um, so you do take away something like I'm going to be part of that uh, 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 Corman quarantine. I'm going to shoot like a little two minute movie for that and uh, see what happens. Uh, so you do get uh, you do learn more on on each one and. Uh, so with, with some of the other ones that I've worked on, it's been hit and miss. So, uh, yeah, you, you take away something from each one. and uh, But with uh, the ones that have already been shot, uh, those I did look, because a couple of those were found footage, uh, which is, one was called uh, Cannibal. The other one is called uh, If I Can't Have You. Those are found footage. Uh, so those were fun to put together. And then I did Skull Evil, and which was the first film that I shot, edited, wrote, directed, did everything myself. Nice. And, it was, and that's how I learned how to use the camera, uh, Premiere Pro, all of that stuff. So, yeah, you do. You definitely get something. Because I never shot found footage before. That, and that was fun to do. I would do it again. Yeah, and, found, uh, found footage is very... Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry? <clears throat> I was just going to say found footage yeah you there are so many different ways to go with it and when you first take take it on it is a very different way of seeing filmmaking but you can do a lot of characters that's why I always find with found footage yeah and, and with those two um, what I've done is I outline and then I just want the actors to hit key things from the outline and otherwise they can uh, they can ad lib they, they can pretty much do whatever they want as long as we follow that outline. And they seem to like that. It's worked well on both shorts. We work and in the same way. we continue doing it that way. Yeah, we, we work in the same way. It's, uh, we, yeah, pretty much improvisation. We work from, like, bullet points. I always say it's a bit like how uh, Larry David does it with Curb Your Enthusiasm. I've always tried to take the same attitude as that. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, recently I've just read how, how he was doing that. Um, I guess still is. Um, and I like that. And, and the actors seem to like it because it gives them a little bit more freedom. They're not so restricted to, to what's on the page. I completely agree with you. Now let's uh, talk about your, because I know you were currently ready to shoot the feature film Ghoul. Can we uh, talk a bit about Ghoul? Yes. Yeah, Ghoul is, you know, obviously because of, of what's going on in the world, you know, a lot of people aren't filming. So that's been put on hold for right now. But it's once everybody can get out there and we can start filming and socializing again, 
uh, that's we're going to go full force on that. So it, it's it's a feature film. Um, it will be uh, completely shot in Las Vegas, and uh, so far the the cast and crew I've contacted everybody and they're still on board. So it's something that uh, I think is fairly original. I'm hoping uh, there aren't too many movies about ghouls. Uh, there are about vampires and zombies, but I haven't seen any, really anything about a ghoul. That's the one thing. <clears throat> the one thing I've always noticed, like when the poster came out and you put it on social media, is such a stunning poster, and obviously it has it brings up ideas of like sleep paralysis and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a really interesting concept to do for, as a as a feature horror idea. Thank you. And that poster helped us a lot. That's uh, the artist by Joe Meredith, and he's he's a filmmaker in his own right. And uh, I I really like his films, and I really promote them. Uh, they have a very kind of cosmic horror feel or almost kind of a cyberpunk feel to them, um, even an uh, industrial feel. And so his art fits that film perfectly. And I like using one artist for each film. Um, I don't kind of want them to go back and forth between projects. So Joe is, is our, our ghoul um, artist. So hopefully once this whole thing is done with and, and like I said, we can get back out filming again. Uh, you know, I can have him do some more art. No, I know, I know that feeling. I just want to get back to filming. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting though, because you've always been someone that I've seen who, you know, you do a lot of promotion for other indie filmmakers. I always see you share like, because you're obviously in quite a network of filmmakers around you as well, kind of similar to what we sort of have in the UK. I've always noticed similar names popping up when you're attached to certain films. Uh, yes, I, I try to promote a lot of people. I, I feel it's it's what we should do, you know, no, all about supporting indie film. And um, I wish uh, more people would do it. They said they'd be kind of more focused on on their thing. Uh, maybe they feel that it takes away from what they're doing. But I mean, I get support. They get support. Um, so I think it's the the right thing to do is is promote other people. No, I completely agree. I mean, it's what we always try to do within Trash Arts. And we try to like, you know, it just helps to build a community. I've always said that a scene develops from a collection of people. It's not just from one person. And generally, most people, like you say, they tend to agree with that idea. Now, um, let's talk a bit about, and I've asked this question a few times, and everyone always says the same thing to me, but ignore money. Ignore, <laughs> this is a dream project. If you could do any film, that like, it could be a franchise or a book, what film would you love to make? Oh, I know that instantly. I am legend. Oh, really? What, from the original, um, was it Omega Man, the original book? Uh, well, the original book, yeah, Richard Matheson is I Am Legend. Yeah, they, they changed the title for the uh, for the Charlton Heston. Ah. Uh. But nobody's, nobody's done the book, and Richard Matheson has talked many times about why can't they just do my book. Um, it's my favorite book. Uh, I love Richard Matheson. He, he's a great writer, um, and it's just never been correctly represented. Um, Last Man on Earth would probably be the closest thing uh, where Matheson wrote the script. Uh, that's the one with Vincent Price. But then something like Omega Man and the Will Smith, I am legend, they don't even come close. I mean, it's it's so far from the from what the book is. Uh, I, they, I don't even know. It's... Will Smith's I Am Legend is pretty much like Brad Pitt's World War Z. I mean, it just has really nothing to do with the book. That's the thing. I, I Yeah, I mean, it's I Am Legend is not a good film. It has some elements that do work, but it's too desperate to be a popcorn film. And everything I know about the original I Am Legend book is it's not really designed as a popcorn movie. No, it's uh, pretty much... A lot of it's one location. It takes place in Los Angeles. And it's primarily in Robert Neville's house, and he's just a regular guy. And uh, where in the movies he's a uh, like a, a scientist, but in the book he's just a regular guy, and uh, he's just basically having to keep these kind of zombie vampires off of his house. And then during the day he goes out and stakes uh, the vampires that he can find. Uh, the ending has from the book has never been done in any of the movies. And because there's a reason why it's called I Am Legend. 
and um, it's just something that could be done on a really small budget. Uh, you don't want a Schwarzenegger or Will Smith in it. Uh, I remember a while back they talked about uh, like Richard, uh, you know, Richard Dreyfus, the kind of Close Encounters Jaws Richard Dreyfus. Mm would have been like perfect for the, uh, if they did a correct adaption of the book to the screen. It's just, to me, it's just an amazing, uh, book. And he's done some of the, you know, of course, Duel and some other things have, have, are just, you know, his uh, Twilight Zones and he's just an amazing writer. Have you ever thought of approaching like doing, as you said, it's, it's quite a simple story to do on an, an indie budget. Have you ever thought of taking the story and being inspired by it and trying to do it as a feature? I would like to, but I think, you know, Warner Brothers, I believe, owns the rights to it. Um, Will Smith might even own the rights to it. As you far could as adjust the name uh, a little bit, you know. It's it's <clears throat> It's been, you know, you could take that story and just tweak it a little bit and just take away the legend bit, you know. Well, and, and they did. Uh, the Asylum made I Am Omega. <laughs> That's the Asylum so they, for you. They tried it. <laughs> So it, it's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that would have to be updated in it, uh, because the book takes place in the 50s, and, um, uh, or was actually, was written in the 50s. So there has that, uh, it, it's all about communism and the Red Scare. So it, it's one of these things of, of Neville not wanting to, you know, uh, uh, conform to communism, and all the people around him are the communists, and so there's... All of these kind of, uh, you know, where the movies don't even touch on that type of stuff. There is a subtext to it. But without it, you wouldn't have, you know, Night of the Living Dead, uh, the original. You wouldn't have uh, Stephen King's The Stand. Uh, uh, there's a lot of writers and filmmakers that have been influenced by that, by that book. No, that's, that's quite interesting. I didn't, know, I didn't know about the communism aspect. And... Um... It's always interesting when cinema's played for like, well, literature in this sense, but when any art's played for sort of borderline propaganda or is it more just the paranoia of the author's ideas rather than being full-on propaganda? So yeah, it would be interesting to see how you could explore that in a modern context. Yeah, you, you would have to change it around a little bit. And then of course, just what's in the uh, uh, what's in the book. Like obviously if you wrote it in the 50s, you didn't have cell phones. So you would, you would have to kind of adapt it to what today is. So if he's walking through his house, he wouldn't have a record player, let's say. You know, he would have to have something else. Or maybe he does. Maybe he's retro. Who knows? You know, and he still has that record player for the book. So it's, it's something that there, there's, I highly recommend if, if people haven't uh, read the book. I mean, it's, the book is easily available. Uh, there's even an audio version of the book that's really good. Um, or just watch Last Man on Earth, which is pretty pretty close to the book, but not not exactly. Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for talking to us, John. Before you leave, do you want to plug anything? Let us know of any releases that are coming up or anything you've got on any VOD sites or anything like that. Um, we got, so, you know, Axibus 1 and 2, you know, we really uh, would like for people to support that. So, like I said, that's at the... Um, uh, Scream Time Films, um, or they can contact me directly through Facebook. Um, that we're really pushing. We're really trying to get that out there. We worked really hard on those DVDs. And, uh, uh, of course, with uh, uh, um, at some point, hopefully, uh, Meet Up Massacre 4, uh, that's something that actually hasn't been brought up yet, uh, that at some point will hopefully come out on DVD. Um, it's just kind of sitting in limbo right now, unfortunately. Um, along with any of the sequels that came after it. Uh, so look look out for that. And then uh, any of the stuff from uh, Brad Twig, a lot of short films and things like that. So it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's nice that to be out here in Las Vegas because there is a community of filmmakers. And so we're all doing stuff. Drew Marvick, Joe Lujan, Heidi Moore, the Mahal Brothers, all them. Uh, so, you know, check out their stuff, too. You know, I try to promote their stuff because it, it's the Vegas scene is, is growing. And uh, eventually, hopefully, we'll get up there like L.A. But uh, but we're here, and L.A. is there. So any, any promotion or, or help that people can give uh, Las Vegas filmmakers, too. Well, thank you very much for talking to us, and I hope you have a lovely day, John. Speak soon.
Well, thank you. You too. Appreciate it. Cheers for that, Sam. It's a good interview. So moving on, uh, last month we said that we were going to do a bit of more of a focus around horror and uh, specific kind of styles or horror adaptations and um, ways to scare people. And uh, this month we've decided to go with haunted houses. So guys, haunted houses. Well, the thing is, it's older than time itself that there's been stories of haunted houses. And I think it, it really plays into something that's kind of primal. A home is supposed to be somewhere where you feel safe, happy, and to have an invasive force that lived there beforehand, or just something evil that's just buried under there, that wants you out of the house, that is something that's never going to go away from people. And I feel with films, they've explored that in so many different ways. I think you're right. In that sense, it's also almost like a, a home invasion. Yeah. It's, it's the fear of the unknown, because how many times have you guys moved into a new house? You don't really know the history of the house as such. I you... always have my precautions to check if it's haunted. Uh, yeah. Well, how do you go about that? You have one viewing, maybe two. And oh, no, then... not the viewing, because that would be weird it's to, it's, to go it's into the house viewing. In, you just get paranoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's viewing, paranoia. Yeah. Not just that's, like... just, that's just me shutting your door and like, swinging it open in the middle of that. <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's a weird thing because it's new. A, a home is new. And the idea of something still being there is terrifying. Well, it's interesting you say that because <clears throat> from the perspective of a person that's either buying or renting that house, it's a new house to them, but the house might not necessarily be new. If you think about um, new build properties, you don't often get films where it's a new build property where, where the hauntings fixated at, um, unless there's some history on the land beforehand. Yeah, like Paul Guys. Yeah. Paul Guys is a perfect example of that. And you saw it a lot between like the late seventies going into the eighties, where obviously there were more new builds being built in like America and, and the UK and stuff. So you got more horror films that focused on what they were building on. Mm. So with um Paul Guys, it plays very strongly into that kind of suburban Ameri white American nightmare of building over Indian, well, Native American land. It's, that's what, I mean, that's with the whole gravestones being buried underneath. And because as a society, there's that general belief that, that we do bury over history, especially history where we've hurt particular nations in the past. And that's something that poor guys really aggressively kind of goes, goes at with it. And the other thing with... Um, in regards to not just the fact that you, you've got new house builds, you've also got the fact that the contact in Port Guys is all through communication itself, because the ghost contacts through the TV to the little girl. Mm. And again, it is that sort of new world mixing with old worlds. And that's something you see a lot in haunted house films, like in general, really. Yeah, it's funny you say Poltergeist, because um, the first one that sort of springs to mind for me is... Uh, the Haunt in, in Connecticut. Yeah. I remember, I don't know if that came out in what, 2005 maybe? I could be wrong. Um, but whenever I first seen that, whenever it came out, <clears throat> I was absolutely blown away by it because usually when I watch a horror film, I'm very, very critical of it and it takes a lot to try and get me on the edge of my seat. When I watched that the first time of viewing, I was like, oh, holy crap, this is really interesting and like they end up having all the bodies built into the house. And there's all these different ghosts and stuff. It's, it's just, yeah, crazy scary. I think the interesting thing with The Haunting in Connecticut is it falls into that particular group of haunted house movies that are based on true stories. Yes. Or at least the loosest, like, you know, it might be based on a true story, especially A Haunting in Connecticut. Because that film, if you're into, like, ghost haunting shows then you'll know that there are many different versions of what people say happened in the house in Connecticut. Yeah. And it was definitely more of an artistic choice, a lot of the stuff that happens in that film. But that whole idea of based on a true events really sticks in people's minds. It makes them scared before they've even be seen real, it. Potentially. Yeah. And it, go it goes back to that primal kind of fear. And um, I think in, like, at least in modern films, the one that really has pushed that has been the Conjuring series. Yeah. And although the Conjuring series aren't technically haunted house movies because they're more like 
following the Warrens with their investigations. But you could argue that, that at least the first one has m more tropes of being like a classic haunted house movie. I would even say that the second one does. But it tries to mix with like its own universe, doesn't it? With mixing in the nuns. Yeah, it does. Um, but you don't. You see glimpses of the nun, but the nun initially starts showing up at the um, the woman's, the Warren, the wife Warren. Yeah, during one of the earlier investigations. Yeah. No, yeah. No, it was at her house, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. she walks into her office and stuff, and then there's the picture, and then it, it ends up being there. But it's not until towards the end of the film that it becomes well it comes to light that the nun is controlling an, like an old man who died in that house, hmm. which again is based on a true story, the Enfield ha haunting. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which is again, yeah. see, the interesting thing with Conjuring Two is like you don't see that many haunted British kind of films, hmm. and I, I feel that's strange because you get so many like period piece ghost haunted sort of stories set in Britain. Where like it's an old castle owned by an old count or something, and they're haunting it, and it's the young person who's taking it over. I mean, to some degree, medieval sort of hauntings as such. Yeah, and, and I feel like that there should be more of those because you, you can play with a lot of um, well, The Conjuring Two did at the very least. You can play with the social class elements with hauntings as well, because one of the general thing with a haunted house is you can't afford to leave. That's why you stay. Mm. They're not rich people who have like, oh, I can just buy another house. It'll be totally fine. It'll be like all goods. Yeah, and you see that in particular in The Conjuring too, because they're like, it's proper, like social class kind of family, well, social class, working class kind of family who are just trying to like survive and they've got this haunting on top of the house. And you do see that a lot of the traits. Um, there's that film recently with, uh, what's his name? Let's get it right. CM Punk, <laughs> the girl on the third floor. And again, it's, it's a similar thing of a person who's trying to fix up a house for him and his... Is she pregnant in the film? Yeah. Yeah, him and his pregnant partner, so they can have a house, but there's a ghost already there. He wants to redeem himself and stuff, doesn't he? And that's why he's gone out there early to do the house up for her. Um, but he's so easily led astray, yeah. like, pretty much as soon as he's got an opportunity, he's led astray. I think that's what I like about that film, is it makes you think he's going to be the hero, but he's not really the hero of the film at all. No. Um, one of the things you just said there was about um, English horror yeah. like haunting houses um, it's interesting to me that there isn't more because England has such a history of like loads of different stories and haunts like well sorry ghost stories mm. that it surprises me that there isn't more if you think about Hampshire so we live in Hampshire which is a county in England and it's considered the most haunted county in the UK which Again, you could do so much around that. Just find that very interesting. Every county claims to be the most haunted <laughs> in the UK. Well, statistically, the Isle of Wight is the most haunted island. Technically, ever. is yeah, that not? The, the, the Isle of Wight is supposed to be the most haunted island in the world per square mile or whatever. Um, have you been over there? Yeah, it's yeah, scary. We... <laughs> they have webbed feet. We've done our ghost hunting trips there. <laughs> one of one of my favourite films, actually. Speaking about. Uh, Haunted Houses is um, The Others. Yeah. I absolutely love The Others. Well, that's the thing, again, like, you get a lot of British haunted house movies that are more focused on those sort of post-war... Is it post-war or is it just during First World War? The I think others? it's during because he's... The husband's not there. Yeah. And that's why they go out to the countryside. But I, th I'm not, I can't remember if it was First or Second World War. I think it's Second because there's definitely signs of planes and stuff. But yeah, they get to the house, and it's all the stereotypical tricks of a trade, ghost story yeah, stuff, yeah. door slamming, things moving, all that jazz. There's that um one scene I always remember the meme that ended up coming out about it, but uh, it wasn't a meme. It was in Scary Movie, I think. You know the kids oh, sitting yeah, under yeah, the, yeah. <clears throat> and she lifts it. I was like, what? Um, it's a terrifying film. It was yeah. yeah but was... when you get to the end and the big reveal, and you're like. What? I think that's the first time I'd ever watched a horror film where you're actually on the other side. You know what I mean? Excuse the pun. Uh, other. No, I get what you mean. And that's the thing. The, the thing with a haunted house movie, it's interesting when you kind of flip it. So you, you flip those sort of tropes that you expect to see in those Victorian ghost story films by going, actually, you know, in that case with that film, they're the ghosts. 
the people are what's causing the strangeness, isn't it? Mm. And it's only so the whole um, way that it's set up is that each of them, so the living can't see the dead, but the dead can equally not see the living. So it's always strange when she sees that child under the blanket because that's the first time she's seen the living. Mm. It's the first time she's alarmed to it. She thinks that it's possessed by ghosts. But then the reveal at the end is, oh, crap. I think that's the thing with Haunted House movies because you have to have that element of, for one, it's, it's a new home and the other element of being like, usually one, only one person's believing because they have to stick with it. They have to be alienated almost. Yeah, and you you can bring that to a more psychological place, or you can mix the two where you ha you're never sure whether it's like, is this supernatural or is this a man losing his mind? So like with The Shining. Yeah. The Shining is a haunted hotel film, and you never, <laughs> throughout you you're kind of questioning, is he crazy from the beginning? Because he comes off crazy as hell at the beginning. And you feel like maybe, are these just two chaotic things that were destined to, to feed the evil in like the, uh, the hotel? But that's where The Shining works really, really well, is that it leaves it to the audience perception. Definitely. Um, so rather than you have a definitive ending that, oh yeah, it was definitely a ghost and he actually only went crazy because the ghosts basically tormented him to the point where he just went mad. You never know. Mm. Is it? Isn't it? And especially with the kid being quite creepy in, in a way as well, <clears throat> with the whole red rum stuff. I think that the whole idea of that playing on that idea is really, really decent. Yeah, I think we were saying, well, we were trying to remember exactly what happens at the ending, but this is something Stephen King quite likes to play with, though, especially with haunted house sort of stories, is to mix in the, is this actually more of an inner trauma going on with the person who needs to understand it mm. or is it more supernatural forces happening around them and um, in the film 1408 they, they definitely explore that and I can't remember what happens exactly at the end but you definitely still on the on the fence it, it, it always sticks out in my mind as being a great horror film like a great haunted house horror film um, <clears throat> but I've forgotten the twist that's it it's either like because there's <laughs> there's some sort of twist in there <laughs> it's something that, like the hotel room the number is obviously relevant yeah it's one of those twisty ones <laughs> this will be the first time that we haven't accidentally given a spoiler of what the twist is <laughs> <laughs> go and watch it we'll be watching it as well we'll probably do a review the whole psychology thing when it comes to haunted house movies if you go back to um, in the 60s when you have one of the most famous haunted house movies The Haunting mm. and The Haunting you're still, again, you're on the fence because this, this woman is slowly losing it throughout and she's got, she's experienced some sort of trauma where you're like, is this something that she's just witnessing or is she plagued by what the house beholds? And that, that's one other thing with haunted house movies. You, you either have it where it is the new people going in and the thing wants them out or the thing in the house wants them to experience whatever they've been through. I was fine with haunted houses. There's maybe like one of two ways you can go like they go into the house and then stuff starts to happen but it's never really revealed what it is and you play with a psychological element of it is it um I, I don't i haven't seen it is it hereditary hereditary is demonic possession i know it's demonic but that kind of idea where she ends up getting isolated and no one believes her and stuff mm. and then goes a bit mental um you either have that so it's psychological or you pre-establish you might not necessarily need to pre-establish it at the start, but you have your Folklore your ghost. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you have a story. So the woman in black. Yeah. I think yeah. so. It's on an island. There's this house. Tragic tragedy struck like years before, and I love that whole kind of Victorian era and ghost story kind of thing with that, or even just haunted house with that. Um, by the end of the second one, though, they kind of twisted it, but the first one is brilliant. <clears throat> and the way that they um, do the jump scares and stuff was very, it was very subtle. I think there was one where she, you could see her in the background behind Daniel Radcliffe's shoulder. And then it cut to her perspective. Yeah. And she then starts walking and you just see in the corner, like she cuts past the mirror. And I, I really enjoyed that because it wasn't led by music. It was led by just the scenes yeah, yeah the tension i think that's that's the other thing with ghost house films um, there's a lot you can do with well how to create that effect mm. 
And I personally, I, there is some CGI that can work, but when you get old practical effects and you don't see the strings, and just getting the right sort of camera angles and uh, the right sort of double exposure for the ghosts and just, I think that's why like, Poltergeist and of course the, the, the horror film we haven't mentioned once, Amityville Horror, mm. the classic of all ghosts, of all true story haunted house movies. It plays on the fact that it was that prime time with practical effects and horror. So you get some really effective scares. Uh, I think one of the most effective elements in any haunted house movie is sound. Yeah. Sound can be so effective in how to scare the hell out of you because we're always hearing those weird sounds around the house and thinking, where's that sound coming from? Where could it be? And tr trying to find a natural source of it, you know? But even equally to that, no sound. If you think of how silence can build tension. Yeah. Like if, if, say, for example, one of the stereotypical ways of doing it is they hear a sound and then the, the main character goes and starts to look, but there's no sound. You just kind of yes, yeah, follow yeah, yeah. them. And that easily builds tension because you're waiting for that jump. Mm. You're, you're kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, there's a reason why like haunted house films can seem, can seem a bit like either like a theme park ride or some sort of puzzle, some sort of game because it... It has to be built on those little points where you're playing in all the different senses of how that character is going to be needs to get the fuck out of the house, basically. And as an audience, they're going to see that the physical, the mental strain, the, the the potentially the violent kind of response. And I think that's what makes a really good haunted house movie that plays on all those levels that you naturally would be like, I would, yeah, if I was in that situation, I'd get the hell out of there. There's claustrophobia to it, isn't there? Mm. <clears throat> I think as well that whenever you've been put into an environment that, you, like you said earlier, you can't necessarily just get up and go. You can run out of the house. Equally, you've got to go back into the house. Yeah, you, you under, and in most, yeah, it's either that is like, that in the folklore sense, you tend to see it more towards, um, yeah, they, they have to stay in the house for whatever reasons outside, or they were planning to stay in the house and that was the mission. But it's interesting when you do put those economic boundaries where they have no other choice. Hmm. And that's the one thing that with a haunted house movie, it's all about endurance. How far would they endure surviving and living in that house with the ghost or is the ghost going to eventually push them out? And yeah. generally speaking, horror movies, they're going to be pushed out. Yeah, they definitely have that. And there is that um, economical side to it where they can't just leave. Um, they're almost cornered. And then as the, the spiritual events, I suppose heighten they get more and more well harder i suppose mm. to endure that that kind of intensity and the stress and that's it and that's that's the basic of like it's just such a i keep saying it but it's a primal fear having all of those kind of stress mm. haunted houses of stress it's that's massive of, stress yeah i think it's almost like there is a, um, a symbolism to that where you could associate and say okay that's that's one of the major themes of a haunted house movie is the idea of stress. Mm. Cool. So hope you guys enjoyed our take on haunted houses. Um, as ever, please give us a subscribe. Um, give us a like. Leave a little comment if there's anything you want us to review or equally just what you thought of the, the podcast. And uh, yeah, give us a share as well if you could. Uh, don't forget, Wednesday, 7 o'clock, you're going to be a star on YouTube. Uh, click the reminder button. Other than that, Trash Arts take out. Bye-bye.